Hey everybody, Savak Seminar is an Executive Secretary Magazine's admin chat present dealing with dates and times in Excel. I am Melissa Escobel. I am a Microsoft Certified Trainer and a Microsoft Office Specialist Master. Um, I am the head chick in charge of SawbuckSeminars.com and the author of Dirty Data. And you can find more information about that book at DirtyDataBook.com. Um, if you want to keep up with everything that I've got going on, including all my webinars and conference presentations and all that other good stuff, uh, keep up with MelissaEskabel.com. That's how to find all of what's going on with me. I'm also a proud member of Executive Secretary Magazine's Speaker Bureau. So uh, to find more information about that, go to executivesecretary.com slash speaker dash bureau. Um, I'm honored to be in such esteemed company on that site. There's some fabulous speakers and Lucy doesn't put anybody up here that she hasn't personally seen herself. So of course, I'm honored to be traveling around with those pals. All right, so let's talk about time. In my world, if you're there and I'm not, you're early. And if I'm there and you're not, you're late. And it's five o'clock somewhere. So that's my, uh, my whole uh, dissertation on time. But really, speaking specifically about Excel, dates and times are numerical representations of a single point in time. So in the case of a date, it's a recognized calendar day. In the case of time, it's a recognized clock time expression. Now there's multiple formats depending on how you uh, read your times and dates and whether you're in the US or you're in Europe. So regardless of how you see it on the screen, if it is a valid date or time, Excel uh, understands it as a number. So they're just plain old numbers like the number one or two or three, they're just plain old numbers. Dates, uh, more specifically serial number dates, are accurately entered dates that when you clear the formats become numbers. So if we typed in 11-1900 and then cleared the format or changed it to just a plain number, it would give us the number one. That is date number one. That's its serial number. Now, if you want to project out into the future a ways, December 31st, 9999, its serial number is 2,958,465. I know most of us really kind of, we're not even thinking about that far ahead, but there you go. So each date from 1900 through 9999 has its own number, and those are referred to in Excel as serial number dates. Now, times also have their own serial numbers, each second on the clock in a 24-hour day has its own serial number from zero, which is midnight and zero seconds, to 11.59.59 p.m., which is 0 .99998843. Uh, other than that zero at midnight, everything is a decimal value. Now, I want you to hold on to this next statement because we're going to see it again when we start doing math. This is a decimal value, a percentage of a 24-hour day. So if you multiplied that by 24, you would get the actual number of hours complete in that day. So if you can imagine if it was 0.5 and you multiplied that by 24, you'd get 12, which means 12 hours into the day or half a day. So hang on to that multiplied by 24 idea. A single moment in time, a specific date and time, can be represented by the date serial number and the time decimal value. So in the case of January 29th, 2020 at 8.39 a.m., that is the serial number of that particular moment in time. And had I included seconds, that would have been very specific to that second on that day. So why all the fuss? Well, since they're numbers, you're actually able to do date and time math. So if you just think about something as simple as a timesheet, if you put in the time you come in and then you put in the time you leave, you can use a simple formula to figure out how many hours you worked or how many hours you worked on a task. 
If you're a VA and you're working for several clients, as you, you know, maybe you can click on a worksheet for client A and type in the task that you did, punch in on it. The shortcut, by the way, is control shift semicolon or control colon. That will give you the current time. Let me show you what that looks like. Control shift semicolon will give you the current time. And then later on, when you're done working on that one, let's say you finish at 9.01 a.m., that is a correctly entered time, you can tell, because it right justified. Then you can do the math, okay, and find out what the difference was between when you finished and when you started. We'll talk a little bit about how formats work. So, they're just numbers. Later than is greater than. The way to understand in what order to subtract things, if you're trying to find the difference in time or difference in days, later than is greater than. And you always want to subtract the lesser than from the greater than, the earlier days from the later days, or earlier times from the later times. So I know it sounds very logical now that you know their numbers, but I'm telling you it's the one place where I have to stop every now and then and go right later than is greater than to remember which way to do the math. Now, if you get it wrong, as you can see in our little deal here, we got it wrong. So it's negative 82 days. So we know that's not really what we were after here. We were after a positive 82. The complication comes if that field is also formatted as a date. So if it were intentionally or unintentionally formatted as a date, you would get a, a bunch of pound signs. So a negative date or negative time will come at you with just an endless string of pound signs. Now, typically when you see this, what you would do is you'd keep stretching out the width of the column to accommodate the data. But man, you can stretch this out till kingdom come and it's not gonna get any better. So if it's a negative time, just try clearing the format or formatting it as a number and you'll end up with something like this. It's probably not what you want, but you'll be clear about the problem and know that you just need to reverse the order in which you're doing that math. So we talked about multiplying by 24. So here you go. You can format it. So there's a couple of things you can do after you do that math. You're probably going to get something like that when you do the math. You can simply format it as hours and minutes. You can clear the formats and multiply it by 24, and that would give you the actual number of hours that you can use. Now, when you do that multiplication by 24, be sure that you put the B1 minus A1 in parentheses. Real quick thing back to Formulas 101, just in case you're wondering why that's the case. Uh, if you've heard of Please Excuse My Dear Aunt Sally or PEMDAS, that is the mathematical order of operation, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. So if you don't put the parentheses in here, what it's going to try to do is multiply A1 times 24 and then subtract that whole mess from B1, which of course isn't what you want. Let's take a look at that with our problem over here. So we did the subtraction and we got a time, and that's not what we wanted we wanted to know the number of hours. So we can come in here and simply use a format, a time format, which is just hours and minutes. And I'm choosing it on a 24 hour clock here so that we're seeing it's one hour and 20 minutes. Now by itself, you can't do anything with this. This is just reporting to you that it's one hour and 20 minutes. There's no math you can do with this yet. What you would need to do if you wanted to actually calculate like billable hours, for example, let's clear the formats here so we can see the actual decimal value of one hour and 20 minutes. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to put this in parentheses and multiply the result of that by 24. And once again, clear the formats and now I have 1.33 hours. Remember it was one hour and 20 minutes? 
one and a third hours, 1.33 hours. So if you want to get it back to usable numbers, you will need to do this type of formula to get there. Now, as you can see, the example on the screen is actually two different dates. So we're starting, let's say, on third shift at 11 o'clock, and somebody worked overtime till the following day at 9 o'clock. So you can start and end on different days. Now, if you're going to put in that kind of math, you can type it in. So let's type in, um, let's see, today, um, 1 30 2020 at uh, 11 30 p.m. And you see how I type that in. That's very specific. It's the day uh, in the U.S. month, day, year. If you type it in differently on your computer, type it in your standard date format, space, hours, colon, minutes, and you could do seconds if you needed it to be that precise. I'm going to press enter here and you see how it converted it to a 24 hour clock. Now, if I come in here and double click and say, hey, what's really in the cell? It's telling me that it's the date and 1130 p.m. But in order for it to register the actual number, it's changing it to a 24 hour clock. Don't worry about that. So this is just what that's going to look like. So if you need to then clear the formats on that, that will give you that date and time number that can be used in math. So let's take a look at ours. We'll put that back to this one. They began on the 30th at 1130. They ended up on the 31st at um, 2 a.m. All right, so there's that. And it's going to remain 2 a.m. because 2 is the number on the clock. So if I want to get the difference, it's later than minus the earlier time. And if I want to convert that to how many hours, I need to put this in parentheses and multiply it by 24. And now I have two and a half billable hours between January 30th at 1130 p.m. and January 31st at 2 in the morning. So you can do that start and end date on different days. So where we've been so far is for properly entered dates and times. Yeah, I know. Some of you are thinking, yeah, if only. I don't get properly entered dates and times. I get text strings that I can read as dates or I can read as times, but they're not actually anything Excel can use. Chapter 6 and Chapter 7 in Dirty Data. Chapter 6 deals with dates. Chapter 7 deals with time. And there's several solutions in there for dealing with dirty date and time data. But if you don't have the book yet, don't worry about it. I'm going to give you a bonus file. I'll show you how to get that in a little bit. That actually shows you what some of these solutions are. So let's take a look at one or two here. I'm going to come over to... This is the bonus file that I'm going to show you how to get access to. And it shows you how to take this particular junk, which is nothing but a text string, and actually turn it into a date that you can use. So that's where we're headed. Let me come over here and kind of do this live and in person. So I brought in some junky dates out here that we can use to practice on. So I'm going to grab these and just copy them and paste them over to this sheet. All right, so we have this mess. Now there's several different ways we can go at cleaning it up. You can uh, use flash fill if you want to, okay? You can separate out the pieces. Sometimes it might need a little help and sometimes it gets it, sometimes it doesn't, so flash fill didn't pick that up. If I do 2020, yeah, so flash fill only did the months for me, but I was going to have to pull out everything else. Now, why am I keen on separating everything? In order to take a yucky date and turn it into a what I call a yummy date, um, you're going to have to convert everything back to year, month, and day, and then recombine it in the date function. So... Again, you could do, uh, you could try um, 
flash fill. That didn't work so hot with this particular format. Um, we can also uh, use text to columns. We can give that a try. So on the data tab, text to columns, and ours is delimited by a space. So that worked out well for separating out the elements, and in fact, it gave us numbers for B and C. This is going to be our problem. This, we can see, means a particular month, but Excel needs a number for that month. It needs a number 1 through 12. So there's a clever little trick, which if you don't know it, you would never guess it in a million years. <laughs> And that is a formula that says take the number one and string it together with this month name. Now, so far, this doesn't look like I've accomplished much. I'll give you that. Then we take that little formula and we turn it into a value, meaning a number. So let's do that. What do you think we have here? That's right, those are serial numbers of a particular date. Let's see what date those are. So it's all the first of the month for these months. That's what stringing together that one and the month name and then throwing value in front of it gets us. But we really just need the month. So what we're going to do is in front of that guy, we're going to type in month. So we're asking it to give us the month of that day. And now we're going to clear the formats. And there we have it, January, February, December, and May. Now out here, we can use the date function to string together the year, the month, and the day. And when I copy this down, we drag this out a little bit. You can see that we have actual dates. Let's clear the format so you can actually see that. There are actual dates, legitimate dates with their own serial numbers. Now that was a lot of rigmarole to do that. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, yeah, and I've got a thousand rows here. Are you telling me I have to do that every single time? No. <laughs> you can actually build a template, if you will, of formulas. So let me go grab those dates again and paste them in our new worksheet here. And make this a little bigger so we can see what the heck we're doing. We can actually use text functions. Now again, I realize this format may not match up with the same junky format you get, but there are multiple techniques you can use to pull things out. One of them, uh, one of the techniques is to use text functions like left, right, and mid. On the left of this cell, give me three characters. That's the whole complication of left. In the middle of this cell, using the mid function, in the middle of this cell, now there's two parameters here, start and number of characters. Starting with and including which character number so we have J-A-N, that's 3, space, that's 4, and the 2 begins in the 5th place. So that's what it means, starting with and including which number. Now, how many numbers do you want back? I'm going to say 2, and I know some of you are a bit concerned about May 9 and Feb 21, but take heart because Excel is going to do some magic of its own here in a moment when we add the value function. And then, of course, equal right, very much like left. It's been pretty easy. On the right of this, give me four. And it gives me back 2020. Now, all of these are text. So we need to change these to value. Now, remember that one ampersand? We're going to do that here. So we want it to give us the value of that. And then we needed to get the month from that date. Boom. Yeah, I just wanted to add up a parentheses. So it took back January. Let's copy this down. And it got February, and it got December, and it got May. Let's go back in there. 
We said take the left three characters, put a one on the front of it, and make it a number value. That's what we did in our text to columns example too. And then just grab the month digit from the result of all of that. And that's what it did. These are easy. We just tell them we need the value of that. And here too, just the value of this. And then we'll use our date function to reassemble it. Year, month, and day. And we'll copy all of these down. I'm just double clicking on the autofill handle. That's how I copy my formulas down. It's because it's just quicker. And you can see that it converted everything, including those single digits. So what it did here in making this a value is it automatically trimmed the spaces. There is actually a function out there called equal trim that will pull all of the extra spaces out of something. And then if I were to put, whoops, no, we don't want to do that. If I were to put value out here, it would change it into the number one. Well, this whole double function thing here is exactly what it's doing automatically by giving it value. So if we were to do just equal value of this guy, it's changing it right into a one. Now, if you find that your version of Excel for whatever reason doesn't automatically trim the spaces, you can use that double function called value and then trim. Now, I want to say that it's doing both as a fairly recent development, but it could be that I never discovered it before. Uh, but just in case your version doesn't do both value and trim, when you use value, then you can use both value and trim. Hot tip with trim, if any of you ever have like issues around VLOOKUP, so you're looking up a string from this worksheet and trying to find that same string in another worksheet and you're staring at them and they're identical, <laughs> at least they appear identical, it may be that one has trailing spaces or leading spaces. If you run trim first, then it will match up in a VLOOKUP. If you have no idea what I just said, no worries. Those are for my VLOOKUPers. Okay, so what you have in the bonus sheet around dates is this. So I've given it to you broken out, right? Here's the month value, the date value, and the year value. And here is just similar to what we just done on the screen, reassembling it using the date function. We'll talk about time in a second. But what I'm also giving you in that um, bonus file is that whole formula as expressed as a single formula. Isn't that a monster? So I want to talk some about that, especially for those of you who are not um, experienced formula writers. Don't worry so much about needing to cram it all into one cell. If you need multiple columns to resolve your dates, that's fine. Just hide the columns if you don't need them. In fact, I actually begin like this. And then once I'm sure I have this information correct, then I start doing a copy and paste like this. For example, let me pull the year formula out and I'm gonna copy everything but the equal sign and press escape and come into this one. And I believe it is the year portion and I'm gonna paste it there. So I do that very tedious process of copying and pasting if I do want to get it to one single formula. So the bright yellow ones are the single formula equivalents of these, okay? So that's the date function. Very similar to the date function is the time function, but rather than year, month, and day, it needs hour, minute, and second. Now what's kind of weird about the time function is minute and second are not optional. It always needs a value, even if that value is null. What? 
Okay, let's go take a look at it in real life here. So let's say we get times like this. Someone's, you know, we get a bunch of times that say 10 o'clock p.m. Well, that's not a valid time. Excel can't do anything with that. But we can grab the value on the left, okay, turn it into a value. We can determine whether it is a.m. or p.m. And then based on that, now this is for those of you not using a 24-hour clock time style, so if it's p.m., we're going to add 12 hours to this time to get the accurate number of hours in the day. 2200 is 10 p.m. Then if we want to express that as a time, we just have the hour here. So if we just have hours, whole hours, we're going to say, great, give me the hour. But since I don't have minutes and seconds, it's okay if I just put in the double comma, so comma for minute, comma for second, okay? And it's just going to interpret it as a null, and it's going to return 10 p.m. Uh, just like with the dates I've given you, the all-in-one single formula version of that, just in case you want it. Let's take a look at something probably more plausible to how you might get times, and that's this guy here. So 10.15 space p.m. or worse, you know, 10.15 p.m., and that's supposed to be a time. Um, you can read it as a time, you understand it as a time, but Excel can't do a thing with this. So, again, we're going to pull out the left two digits as the hour. In order to get the, uh, and we're going to, of course, convert that to an hour, of a.m., p.m., so it's the same as above. Now we've got to pull out the minutes. Remember the mid function? Well, in this case, they're giving us a dot or a period. So we're going to find that period in that whole expression within text. We're going to add, because what find returns is the position of that. So it's going to return three. Mid says, where do you want me to start? Well, we really want it to start on the fourth position with the one and give us two for minutes. So it's still mid in this uh, cell, starting with and including this number, give me this many characters. It's this that has the interesting calculation. Find means find me the position number of this guy in this cell. And we just want to add one to that to get our one, two, three, four, rather than a three. All right, so now we have minutes. And again, using our time function, we now have an hour and we have a minute. And because we don't have seconds, and seconds is not optional, we're going to put a comma there at the end. If you try to not have that comma, let me go up here and edit that. If you tried to not have the comma, it would not let you. It'll tell you you've entered too uh, few arguments for this. It really needs that extra comma in order to uh, calculate this correctly. So now it says it has enough because it had the extra comma. So again, in the bonus file, you've got each of these uh, split out individually. You've got the uh, time function uh, composite formulas, and then you have the all-in-ones for those times as well. So uh, these kinds of problems are the kinds of problems I work with in Dirty Data. In this case, it's dates or times, but there's all sorts of ways data comes in and it's not right. <laughs> so that's what the book deals with. And there's a couple of solutions, and you'll see how those work in the um, in the workbook. By the way, there's also a handout for this, which will be at the same link. So in addition to being able to do straight ahead date math and get dates into shape where you can actually do date math, there's a bunch of functions that come with Excel that you can use to do more kinds of date math. First of all, you'll find these on the formulas tab in the little date and time button. You can see how many there are. I'm just going to show you a few of my favorites here, and these are also in the bonus file. So let's take a look at net work days. A lot of people think this has something to do with a network, and it doesn't. It is net work days. 
Now, let me give you a little bit of the setup behind here. You can see in a lot of these formulas, I'm using a named range called Fed Holidays. That's not a, um, a regular thing in Excel. I just put in all of the holidays for 2020, which I got at timeanddate.com. These are the US federal holidays. And then I went up here to the name box and I simply typed in Fed Holidays. So that's how to name a range. If you've never heard of a named range, that's what one is. The reason I prefer to do that, because I could have done this. Um, so in the formula, rather than Fed Holidays, I could have put in um, F2 Absolute through, let me do that again, F2 Absolute through, I don't know why it's not letting me do that. Okay, F2 absolute through uh, F, what is that, 12. So F12 absolute. Okay, I could have done that, but then I would have to do that for every formula and try to remember what that was. Instead of doing that, I named that range. So all I have to do when I'm building my formula is just type in the word fed, and there it pops up right at the top of the list and all I have to do is hit tab. So that is why this is Fed Holidays. It is not a parameter that's in Excel. I simply put in a list of dates, which could be anywhere in the same workbook, by the way, and then I named it Fed Holidays. All right, back to our regularly scheduled program. Network Day says I'm going to take a start date and I'm going to take an end date and it's Net of weekends and net of holidays, how many working days is that? So we might look at 617 through 97, that's three months. That's probably about, you know, you know, two and a half. So what, 60, um, 75 days. And it's like, no, it's actually 57 because there's holidays in between there. So it actually takes out the holidays and weekends and says, this is really how many days you have working days. That's net work days between this day and this day. Start date, end date, holidays. Now you notice how holidays here has brackets around it. That is an example of a um, optional uh, argument. So if you didn't include that, it would still calculate it just net of weekends. Let's take a look at work day. I love Workday for actually doing things like trying to figure out how long a project's going to take. So Workday says, give me a start date and how many workdays it's going to take to get this done. And I also want to know the holidays so I don't include those while I'm counting forward to come up with your due date. So if it's going to take 57 days, um, then it's going to end on 9-8. Now you may be looking at these two going, well, why don't they both say 9-7 or 9-8? The way to think about this is uh, after 57 days, the next day will be 9-8. This is the difference. The span in between these is 57. This is the next date after these dates are done. So it's, it's a one day kind of thing. If it bothers you when you're doing this calculation, you can always do something like minus one at the end of that, and that will give you that nine seven. And I have done that at times. And we now know why we can do that just minus one because it's just a date serial number. Okay, so there we have work day. Um, the way this works in real life, so if I have this task over here and it's gonna start today, and I know it's going to take 10 working days to complete it. My due date, I can calculate with work day as this start date and 10 working days. That's showing up as a date, but I'm going to clear the formats. And of course, we have our federal holidays in there. Our federal holidays, and there we go. And that's going to give us this. So let me clear the formats on this guy so that we can see it's actually the 10 days. Oops. Clear formats, the 10 days that we entered. And then I'm going to apply a date here. So you can see that that is the actual due date. 
So the formula says, give me a start date and the number of working days it's going to take to get this done. And give me the where I can find the holidays and I'll tell you when this is due. So that is Workday. There's a few others that I really like. E-date says, given a particular starting day and a number of months into the future, tell me what that date is. Well, I mean, we could have done this one in our heads, right? June 17th, three months is 917. But what if we're talking about 22 months? What if we're talking about 30 months? What does that look like? So we can simply type in that number of months and it will tell us how many months forward that is to the date. EO month is very similar to E-date and uh, the HR folks really like this one because if you began at any time during the month of June, in six months you're going to have a review during some time before the end of that month. So the due date of your review is sometime before 1231 2020 and it's clever enough to know leap year so last year let's say um 2019 um actually let's do that yeah and zero months forward so whatever the end of the month is that month you can see it gave us 228 2019 but if it's this year this year's a leap year, so we have 229. So we will take into consideration leap year and give you the correct end of month date for that. So if you have a another way you could use this is like in my world, you know, I, I work all month, I send out a billing for this date and this date and this date and this date, but I have something that says end of month, when is that gonna actually be invoiced? If it's invoiced at the end of the month, I can simply use EO month to do that. And then finally, one of my favorites, which is date diff. And date diff is a hidden function. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, out here, if I do equal EO month, you can see it pops to the top. And when you press escape, you get this beautiful little pop up with all the syntax. But watch what happens when I type in date diff. It's not there. Even if I do open parentheses, it seems like it's going to let me do that, but it doesn't give me any tool tips. You have to know that what date diff wants is the start date, the end date, and how you want to see the result expressed. In this case, it's the number of days, but what if I want to know the number of months? And you need to put that in double quotes. So that would tell me this is two complete months. If you're just looking at six and nine, you're saying, ah, three months. But we're talking complete months. So why is that important? Let's, uh, let's take a look at a typical HR thing. Let's say somebody began their employment on 11-1-2000, uh, yeah, 2007. And we'll take a look at today's date. And we want to uh, find out how many complete years that is. Well, date diff is the only function without doing a whole lot of rounding and truncating. Here's the start date. Here's the end date. So this is the only one. We want to see this in years to give us complete years, not the um, not a rounded number or a truncated number, but the number of complete years or complete days or complete months. So just remember DMY needs to be in double quote and you won't find much inside Excel and you won't find it on your drop down in formulas. You won't find date diff. It is kind of a hidden function, but it's there. Start date, end date, and um, how you want to see the results is what you want to have in there. Okay, so that bonus file I mentioned is at bit.ly saw sem admin chat, all lowercase, one. bit.ly, sasem, admin chat, one. And you'll find the handout and the bonus Excel files with all of the date and time formulas that we talked about. I hope you found today's information useful. Please feel free to reach out to me. You can go to melissaescobell.com and hit the contact page. 
You can uh, go to visit, you can visit dirtydatabook.com to buy the book and see the companion videos that are there that go with the book. If you already have the book, um, in chapters where you see a V next to the chapter name, it means there's a companion video. And if you come out here to the, um, to the web, and go to dirtydatabook.com and scroll down about midway in the page, you'll see tips from Dirty Data. And if you click there, it'll take you to the YouTube channel and there will be all of the videos that um, have the tips with them uh, in the book, that have a V in the book. So once again, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed today's Advent Chat. Everybody take care. Have a great day.